Today, I would like to discuss two really cool ideas that I think can make your Godot projects and honestly, all your programming a lot cleaner, faster, and way more fun to build. I'm talking about composition and decoupling. Composition is all about building complex things by combining smaller focus parts, just like putting together Lego bricks. Instead of creating giant complicated scripts, we break things down into reusable pieces that are easy to manage. And decoupling is making sure that those parts don't depend too much on each other. When things are decoupled, you can change one part without breaking everything else. The cool thing is, in Godot, composition and decoupling go hand in hand. Think about it. You build your game by composing scenes from small independent nodes. And you keep them decoupled by using tools like signals and clear communication between its parts. When you really think about it, Godot naturally encourages composition through its scene system and nodes. In Godot, a game object, like a player or enemy, is often a scene made up of smaller nodes, like a character body 2D, an animated sprite, and a collision shape 2D. Each node handles one responsibility, drawing, physics, interactions, etc. You compose a character by putting these nodes together rather than writing one giant class that tries to do everything. Also, scripts in Godot can be attached to nodes independently, further supporting composition. For example, you can have an abilities.gd script that can be attached to any character or enemy and reference a dash ability.gd script that could be attached to the character that dash and ignored for those that don't. Each path is modular. If you want a new character that only moves and jumps, but doesn't dash, you can reuse the moveability.gd and jumpability.gd scripts. No need to copy and paste code. In this video, I would like to explore some of the possibilities of using this awesome system and show you exactly how composition and decoupling can work together and why mastering them will level up your Godot game development. Let's get started. If you're new here, I love to do game jams because I think it's a great way to practice my game dev skills and learn a new skill or system. It actually forces me to make quick decisions and finish my project. So what better way to figure out decoupling and composition than by participating in the Microjam 038. The theme was zombies and there was a prerequisite. Zombies are your friend and I absolutely love zombies. You know what? I think one of the best zombie games of all times is Days Gone. But that might be an unpopular opinion. Let me know what you think in the comments. The zombies in Days Gone are not your friend, but you know who are friends? Fireboy and Watergirl. If you're not familiar, Fireboy and Watergirl are not zombies, but the game is a cooperative puzzle platformer where players control two characters. Fireboy, who can walk through fire but is harmed by water, and Watergirl, who can walk through water but is harmed by fire. The goal is to navigate through levels filled with traps, buttons, and puzzles that require teamwork to solve. Players must use both characters together to reach the exits and collect gems, controlling both characters at once, or you can play with a friend. The controls are simple. You use A, W, and D keys to move Watergirl and the arrow keys to move Fireboy. So my goal is to create a player character that is modular using composition so that I can build the movesets and abilities for each player character. In my game, you control two zombies that help each other rescue the player. A, W, and D keys control red eyes, and the arrow keys control tank. For the game jam game, I did not add much in terms of abilities. As a matter of fact, it was quite limited. Both players could move and jump. The only difference was that red eyes moved faster than tank and jumped higher, and could activate switches, but could not walk through fire. Tank was slower than red eyes but could walk through fire and could be used as a block for red eyes to jump on to reach higher places. I could not find a lot of creative ways to use these abilities because I only had like one day to make the game because I had a lot of stuff going on that weekend. However, I really wanted to build a game so that I would have something to try out composition and decoupling. I set up the input, which was really the easiest thing to do. In the project settings, input map, I set the input for each zombie and a player character. So ZA would be red eyes, 
and the input would be A, W, and D. And ZS would be tank and would use the arrow keys. I also set up PL for the player, which would use both W, A, S, and D and the arrow keys to move. The reason why I'm taking time to explain this now will make more sense when we start building the new character controller using composition. As I mentioned before, I only had one day to do this. So I just thought the best way to do this was the simplest way. No complicated systems because there were only two characters and no fancy inheritance or state machines. No time for that stuff. All Tank needs to do is move and jump. That's it. So I made a really basic script that took the ZS left, ZS right, and ZS jump input that I set up to handle Tank's movement with the arrow keys. Now there was a little more going on with Red Eyes. However, the movement code was mostly the same as the movement code for Tank. The only thing that changed was the input. I used the ZA left, ZA right, and ZA jump input to move Red Eyes, and also added two signals to be emitted. When she collided with the switch, it would raise a platform that would allow Tank to jump up to the higher level. But now that the jam is over, this is a perfect time for refactoring to focus on making the system modular and more flexible. I decided to create a player character that was a little more interesting with a more diverse moveset that I could use to give Red Eyes and Tank more abilities than just running and jumping. I added a dash ability, a wall jump ability, and a hanging ability. All the abilities are totally modular and are independent of each other and added as children to the parent ability node. Now the move ability is not connected in any way to the dash ability and the wall jump ability is not connected to the jump. That way it's easy to just add the node with the desired ability to the character. It's that simple. Now let's take a closer look. The player is made up or composed of a character body 2D which handles movement of a character or 2D physics body by a script an animated sprite 2D which can be used to display multiple textures to create animations and a collision shape 2D which is used to detect collisions. So right here we can see that Godot already uses its version of composition when creating scenes. Now the classes themselves do inherit from a base class but that's another discussion that we don't need to worry about here. If you're not familiar with inheritance, I made a video that explains the concept and you could check it out at the end of this video. I will leave a link to it in the description. Next, I use empty nodes as containers to hold the abilities.gd scripts for the ability code. Although I could have used node2d nodes instead, I just chose to use empty nodes because the scripts does not need to have a position. Then attach scripts to both the player and the abilities node. I think that it's best to look at these scripts side by side so that it's easier to understand the connection. Let's take a look at how these scripts work together. This is where both composition and decoupling really starts making sense. The player script extends character body 2D and it handles gravity and movement with move and slide. But notice something important here. Instead of doing all the work itself, it hands off some responsibility to a variable called abilities, where it accesses the physics process delta function. This line accesses the ability script and lets it take over doing whatever needs to be done this frame. The player doesn't care what specific abilities exist. It just knows that the abilities class will take care of them. And that's the concept of the coupling. Now, the ability script itself is super flexible. I gave it a class name, abilities, so that the player script can access it using this line. In the physics process function, it loops through all of its child nodes and checks if it has a process ability method and then calls it. Again, it does not know what these abilities are. It just requires that they are there and trust them to do their job. Here's one of those children the move ability script. It has the process ability function, which is checking for input and handling horizontal movement. The exported variables are of type string for the left action and right action of the player. These are the input names from the Godot input map. By default, they are set to PL left and PL right. 
But again, you can change these in the inspector. This makes the script flexible because I could reuse this ability on a different character for their specific input. The exported var player is a reference to the actual character body 2D, the object we want to move. I can tell it what to move by assigning it in the inspector. The exported player sprite is a 2D sprite we're flipping left or right when the player moves. It's separate from the movement itself and it's purely visual. This keeps visual logic out of your player script and contained here in the ability. So a quick recap. The player delegates to an abilities node. The abilities node delegates to each ability script it has as a child, like the move ability. Each piece is small, reusable, and swappable. Want to add a dash or jump ability? Just drop in a new node with a process ability function. No need to rewrite the player script. Let's create a new character. I have built this player character with all the abilities here. So an easy way to create new characters with the abilities that I like will be to save each ability node branch as a new scene. To do this, I just right click the ability and save branch as scene. Then I can delete all the abilities and save the player character. Let's make red eyes. First, I will make a new folder called characters and click OK. The next step is to duplicate the player and give it the name Red Eyes. And I will move it to the Characters folder. Next, I will rename the character body 2D to Red Eyes and change the sprite. Then, I just drag the abilities that I would like to add for Red Eyes. The Move, the Jump, the Wall Jump, and the Hang. Now it's time to set up the abilities. First Move. In the Inspector, because I exported the input as a string, I just need to change the names to the input for red eyes, which was the A and B keys, to ZA left and ZA right. And to assign the exported variables for the player and the player sprite, all I need to do is click on the box and choose red eyes and the player sprite. Now for the jump and wall jump, I need to enter the input as ZA jump, then click on the box for the player and choose red eyes. And do the same for the wall jump ability. For the hanging ability, I will need to set up the input for ZA down in the settings input map. I will use this to cancel the hanging ability and let go of the ceiling. I assign the input to the S key. Now we can delete the player from the game and add red eyes to the scene. And there we have it, a new character with the abilities that we just specified. Creating tank is just as easy. We just duplicate the player and call it tank and go through all the steps as before. I moved it into the characters folder and renamed the character body 2D and changed the sprite. I increased the size of the animated sprite 2D and the collision shape 2D so that tank is bigger than red eyes. For the abilities, I gave him the move, jump and dash ability. Then went through all the setup for each ability. For the move, I entered input as ZS left and ZS right for the arrow keys and assigned the player sprite. For the jump, I entered ZS jump. And for the dash ability, all I had to do was choose the player sprite since I did not export the dash input because I chose to assign it directly in the script. And that's it. We now have two different characters that we created using composition and decoupling. I did not go into much detail on the way that the abilities were created. The focus here was to show how composition and decoupling can be used to create multiple characters and abilities. If you would like a more detailed explanation, leave me a comment on what ability you would like me to take a look at. So where do we go from here? The next step would be animations. And that's already handled quite intuitively by using an animated sprite 2D. So I think that a great place would be to have our players interact with the level and use composition and decoupling to create modular interactions that can be used by multiple characters. I guess we can tackle that in our next video. So don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out. I would absolutely love it if you would join me on my journey. Thanks for watching. Today we explored two powerful game design ideas, composition and decoupling, and how they make your Godot projects cleaner, more flexible, and way easier to scale. From creating modular abilities for our player, 
through delegating logic through a reusable system, we built something that's easy to understand, test, and expand. I really hope this video helped you in some way. If it did, drop a like, hit subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next one. And while you're here, why not check out one of my other videos, like this one that breaks down how inheritance works in Godot, or head over to my itch.io page and try out Zombie Sidekick. I'd love to hear what you think. Until next time, happy coding, and I'll see you in the comments. This has been DRAGO Games.